Good afternoon. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Mike Buttonham, and I'm the Sustainability Environment Lead at Grain Farmers of Ontario. I wanted to welcome you to our Grain Talk webinar on fertilizer. As we head into April, with uncertainty surrounding the weather and crop inputs, we have assembled a webinar to discuss some of the fertilizer issues at hand. Today, we'll focus on fertilizer as we approach the beginning of planting. In some areas across the province, we are already seeing spring cereals getting planted. As a reminder to participants, a CCA CEU credit will be shared at the end of the webinar. Before we get into our first guest speakers, I just wanted to share a few highlights around the agronomic response and some of the key things surrounding 4 our nutrient stewardship, as it may be something very timely to discuss given this year. We know strong yields and crop quality can be influenced by fertilizer and nitrogen, and we know that not every year all nitrogen applied is available and used by the plants. We know that this loss happens into the environment through both the ground and the air. And just to focus that this year, in a year surrounding some uncertainty around nutrient availability, focusing on that 4 our nutrient stewardship will be key. The concept ultimately is simple, ensuring the right source at the right rate, at the right time and the right place, but can really serve a lot of important steps to ensuring your crop has the right nutrients for a profitable, high yielding crop. Another thing to note is around soil testing and soil testing is a way to put the four R's in reality. We know that soil testing gives a better understanding of your soil's fertility and can allow better decision-making to maximize that product productivity while ensuring minimal nitrogen loss and environmental loss. We know that updated soil tests are foundation to any cropping plan. So with that said, we'll turn it over to our first guest speaker today, Brendan Burney. Brendan Burney is the director for District 1 Essex and was elected as chair of the board of directors in 2021. He was first elected as a director in 2015 after serving as a delegate for five years and the local chairman for three. Brendan, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike, and I'm happy to be here. And yeah, as Mike said, I'm chair of the Grain Farmers of Ontario. I farm uh, just outside of the town of Essex in Essex County here with my family. Um, so just wanted to say a few words before we get started. Um, as you would know, the Grain Farmers of Ontario works on many different areas. And, and as of right now, the, the fertilizer issue is top of mind and is the one that we're working the hardest on. I do want to commend our staff and our team for all the work they've done to date as we try to sort through this for you and all of our farmer members uh, as well. Um, before we get started, though, I do want to make sure to, to mention the understanding of the, the tragic situation in the Ukraine um, and what's going on over there and, and in their people. Uh, we are, we're thinking of them as we go through this season. Um, we're seeing some of the farmers over there trying to get crop planted in something that uh, is unimaginable to us. So we are trying to, uh, to do our part uh, in Ontario to grow as much food as possible because we do know that they are going to need our help after. Um, and in order to do this, we're going to need to have fertilizer access and the inputs to do so. Um, fertilizer was already a big issue, as we, we know from our delegates policy day when we talked about that in December. So now with uh, the world situation, it's it's constantly evolving and and we're trying to, to sort this out as best we can for everybody. Um, we have been asking the, the provincial and federal governments to be our advocates to try to sort this out, to make sure that in this new situation that we have fertilizer and inputs available to you when you do want to go to the field. Uh, we do understand the risk at this point is is never greater to you on the farm. We've got high uh, input costs, uncertainty around fertilizer, high costs with that, as well as fuel uh, and an escalating carbon tax. So we have been hearing lots of different things about fertilizer shortages, trouble in terms of getting ac accurate pricing, uh, how the tariff is going to work and the uncertainty around that. Um, where we're at right now is we, we do know that or where we know fertilizer needs to come into Ontario for the spring uh, and be available for you on your farms. Tariffs are being applied, but there's a lot of uncertainty around that. And we're hearing from a lot of farmers already about uh, whether the availability or lack of pricing, not being able to accurately get a, a price on what they're looking to go to the fields in a few weeks with. Um, so we're just kind of the advice on my end is work closely with your retailers. Things are evolving constantly and changing daily. Um, and additionally, reach out to our office with any on the, the farm issues that you're presented with is those case studies help us a lot when we talk to government and they're looking for real world um, examples of what's going on on Ontario farms. So 
with that, I'm happy to be here today and answer any questions, uh, but I will turn it over to our CEO of the Grain Farmers of Ontario, Crosby Devitt, for some additional comments. Thank you, Brendan. I uh, appreciate that update. And uh, certainly I'll build a little bit more on, on some of Brendan's comments around fertilizer and the, the whole situation as, it, as it's been evolving over the last number of months, but certainly over the last month uh, in, in a big way. So um, as Brendan mentioned uh, here at GFO, we've uh, mobilized a lot of resources around the whole fertilizer issue and availability and have met with countless politicians, government officials, as well as industry to uh, really understand what's happening and what we can do about it and what what we need as farmers to be able to go to the fields uh, confidently this spring. So um, specifically, I do want to say uh, we've had a lot of support from Minister Thompson and Premier Ford directly just on uh, helping us in our advocacy to the federal government and, and doing what they can and and, and a lot of policymakers and, and MPs and, and others uh, federally as well. So um, the issue is certainly known, um, but there's a, there's a number of things that still need to happen <laughs> to feel comfortable going to the field. So I just want to recap the, the three main things that we're looking for uh, to help us as farmers get to the field this spring are are, uh, I'll just outline them. So the first one really is ensuring that the product, uh, pr particularly nitrogen, uh, arrives on time and in the quantities that we're looking for. As Brendan mentioned, there's still product that does need to come into Canada, into Ontario uh, for the spring planting and uh, the time is tight. So we're urging government uh, and others to do everything they possibly can uh, to be able to help that happen. The second is around fair pricing, and we've certainly seen a, a huge escalation and rise in prices of fertilizers of all types and all sources. Um, and what we're looking for there is uh, that you know there's there's some transparency and understanding, and and the right prices are passed on. And uh, certainly around tariffs and a whole lot of uncertainty there uh, creates a little bit of chaos in the marketplace. So what we're looking for there is that there's good uh, good fair pricing. Uh, for the farmers and for everybody involved. Um, we do know that the USDA has announced uh, something they call a, a fairness portal uh, to help farmers report prices and things like that. So we've urged, we've urged the federal government to, to seriously look at something like that for Canada here. And third, uh, if we do look at a worst case scenario, uh, which I certainly hope that we don't, um, but um, the financial support side of things, especially with tariffs being applied to fertilizer coming in and, and adding to the price and not filtering right down to the farmer. Uh, certainly, we know that our programs and BRM programs that we have today aren't, are not designed, uh, nor should they necessarily be for a situation like this. Um, so we're, we're uh, hoping that doesn't uh, come to fruition but, uh, and, and is needed, but uh, should it be there, we, we're asking our, uh, our, our government officials to start looking at that uh, to be prepared. So um, really the main goal is to help uh, do everything we possibly can to allow you as farmers to get to the fields uh, with confidence that the product that you need uh, to grow a good crop is in place and at fair prices and uh, not to be forced into making decisions based on availability. Um, but we all know, I guess, going into spring, we have to be ready. And so one thing I, I look at and, and we look at it and how fortunate we are here in Ontario to have the resources available to us, um, the experts uh, such as Ben that we're going to hear from today uh, to share uh, tools, techniques and expertise to help us do a better job. So uh, with that, thanks for joining us today and I'll turn it back to Mike. Thank you to you both, Brendan and Crosby, for that introduction. And at this point, I'd like to introduce our next guest speaker, Ben Rosser. Ben Rosser works as a corn specialist with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Ben received a Bachelor of Science and a Master's in Science in Agronomy from the University of Guelph. He enjoys working on applied research projects with Ontario corn, gr corn growers and works out of the Crop Science Building at the University of Guelph. Thanks for joining us today, Ben. We look forward to your presentation and, and touching on the keys to uh, you know, nitrogen availability in corn and, and what it means for this upcoming year. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. And if you could share your screen, um, we'll let you go. Thanks, Mike. And uh, thanks to Grain Farmers for the invitation to speak. Um, yeah, so obviously, you know, since last fall and kind of all through the winter time, um, you know, nitrogen has been a, a big question. Uh, on top of growers' minds. I'm just going to try sharing this. Oh, maybe lost my, oh, here we go. 
Just want to confirm you guys can see this okay. Looks great. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah. So obviously, you know, nitrogen has been a big question ever since, you know, prices kind of started to rise back last fall and uh, has certainly been, been a big discussion point over the, the winter here and, uh, and coming into the spring. So I thought I'd go a little bit over, you know, what, uh, what end rate adjustments should be made for high fertilizer prices in 2022. And then um, how can you ensure you're going to get a good return on investment for P and K fertilizer applications uh, in 2002 as well. So on the first question, you know, how does, uh, how does optimum end rate change of fertilizer prices? I'm going to kind of go through that scenario in terms of what you might want to think of if you're looking at nitrogen rate adjustments in 2022. And I'm going to go through two examples. So the first one is the Ontario corn nitrogen calculator. So uh, if you haven't used it before, you can go on to gocorn.net and it's the Ontario corn nitrogen calculator um, icon on the homepage. Or you can also go on to the agronomy guide for field crops and uh, in the corn chapter, they also have it all in writing as well, where you can kind of go through the, the different uh, steps to, to calculate it. It'll give you the same number if you use either way, but those are two ways that you can, uh, can use the nitrogen recommendations. So if the question is, you know, how does our nitrogen management in terms of rates change when the price of nitrogen changes? Um, the nice thing with the end calculator is that you can actually go in and change prices and it will change the recommendation based on the economics. So I'm going to go through one example. It might not represent your uh, examples on your own farm, but it'll still show how you can, uh, can see what the change would be if you're going to change the economics in regards to price of nitrogen or, uh, or price of corn. So in this example, I'm going to say we're on a clay loam soil. Previous crop is one of the questions. I'm going to say our, our average yield is 200 bushels an acre. We're in a 3000 CHU or heat unit zone. And our previous crop is cereals with uh, straw not removed. So now I'm going to break that in. That, those are kind of our basic agronomics. I'm going to break that into our two kind of price scenarios. So uh, I'm going to look at what might be a 10 year average in terms of nitrogen and corn prices and what might be a 2022 uh, scenario. So again, your prices might differ a little bit, but I'm going to kind of use these numbers as our two scenarios. I'm going to say our 10 year average corn price is $5 a bushel. I'm going to say we would usually apply UAN uh, for somewhere around $370 a metric ton. So that would work out to 60 cents per pound of nitrogen. And uh, I'll talk about price ratios a little bit later on, but if you want the price ratio of that, so that's pounds of nitrogen to pounds of corn, uh, that would be a 6.7 price ratio for our 10 year scenario. And if we look at 2000, oh yeah, sorry. So the, the recommendations based on that 10 year average scenario uh, for this field would be 187 pounds for a pre-plan application. Or if you're going to side dress in this case, uh, on average, the, the data in this database would suggest side dressing is a little bit more efficient. So it gives a bit of a nitrogen credit for that. And it would say a side dress recommendation would be 150 pounds of nitrogen. Uh, for that scenario. Now, again, if we look at our 2022 prices, again, I, I first I first used these for an article I wrote a couple months ago. So prices have probably changed since then, but um, it'll give at least a general idea. At that time, I said uh, 675 a bushel of corn for this fall uh, fall delivery. Again, I said we are using UAN this time at 740 bucks a metric ton, so about a, a dollar twenty uh, per pound of nitrogen. In this case, our price ratio is 10. So again, our both corn and nitrogen have gone up, but our nitrogen price has gone up relatively more than corn. So that's pushed our price ratio up a little bit higher uh, to a 10. Again, if you enter those values, you'll get recommendations. And you can see our pre-plant recommendation for this case is 167 pounds and our side dress is 134. So you know, if our question is how do we change, uh, how, does, how would nitrogen management maybe change given the prices? What we're really interested in is how has the recommendation changed for our two price scenarios. So again, if you look at pre-plant recommendations, just changing prices of corn and nitrogen uh, would suggest a 20 pound reduction in pre-plant rates. And if we're looking at side dress rates, it would suggest a, a 16 pound per acre reduction for nitrogen rates for these scenarios, which makes sense. Obviously nitrogen has gone up. We're going to pull those rates back a little bit to uh, compensate for the fact that it's more expensive relative to corn. So when I first ran these numbers, you know, it was kind of surprising. And the cost of nitrogen has doubled or, or gone up 100% versus 
but our, our end recommendation has only gone down about 10%. And, you know, when you first think about it at first glance, man, that really didn't seem to make sense. You can double the price of nitrogen, uh, but only reduce the nitrogen recommendation by 10%. So I kind of wanted to go through some more steps and kind of prove, you know, why is that the case? So uh, if you're not skeptical, but if you're wondering the same reason like I am, uh, I'm just kind of go, going to go through some nitrogen curves and kind of show why, uh, you know, why, uh, why we only see such a small decrease in recommendations given the big change in corn uh, prices. So this is an example of a nitrogen response curve in corn. So this is real Ontario data. Uh, these were from some nitrogen trials that uh, Greg Stewart did when he was corn specialist, uh, kind of in the 2011 to 2015 timeframe. And uh, basically, we would go out and apply five nitrogen rates in a cornfield, collect yields at the end of the year, and you're able to develop these curves. And most of the time when we fit these curves, that the best fit for them was what they call a quadratic plateau. So it's just a fancy way of saying that the line uh, you know, starts as a curve, uh, in this case, a quadratic. And uh, eventually you get to a rate of nitrogen where corn's not responding to yields anymore and past those nitrogen rates, uh, it plateaus because yield's not responsive. Now, the one thing that's important to mention about a quadratic is that uh, as you increase nitrogen rates, you're getting more yield, but the yield you're getting is accumulating at a slower rate. So you get your best bang for your buck in terms of yields uh, with the first pound of nitrogen. And as you increase rates, you're still getting more, more yield but the amount of yield you're getting is uh, is less and less all the time. And that's that's kind of important in terms of why the, the rate didn't go down a lot when we changed those numbers. But I'll get into that in a little bit. If you've taken a soil science class, uh, you've maybe made one of these graphs or seen one of these graphs before. But if our question is, what is the return to nitrogen in, uh, for this yield response curve? Then we would take our yield response curve, just multiply that by the price of corn to see what our revenue is in the field. So again, I'm using the 2022 price scenario for these red lines, and, and here's our corn revenue curve. Just simply taking our yield curve and multiplying it by the price of corn. In this case, I said 675 a bushel. Of course, we want to look at our nitrogen costs. So in this case, this is just incrementally adding a pound of nitrogen uh, up to you know 240 pounds or more of nitrogen. So you know we'd expect obviously that's a linear relationship. Every pound is going to cost us a dollar twenty more uh for for an application and then of course if our question is you know where's our, our maximum economics in terms of a nitrogen rate that will maximize our, our economics uh, we want to look at the difference between the corn revenue and the cost of that nitrogen so in that case here this is just our net return for those two items and you can see it peaks kind of between that 100 to 120 pound nitrogen rate so our optimum nitrogen rate the amount that's going to maximize economics for this curve would be uh, somewhere in that realm. So in this case here on this curve, uh, it would be 116 pounds per acre. So again, it kind of makes sense when I talked about quadratics, if we're if each pound of nitrogen is costing us a buck 20, um, if you're in a lower spot in the curve and that extra pound is gonna give you $5 of corn, well, it makes pretty good sense that uh, you're gonna put that buck 20 pound of nitrogen on because you're gonna get $5 worth of corn. Over time, those gains diminish. So, you know, even when we're uh, getting a buck 40, you know, it still makes sense. We're still making more value in corn than what it's costing us in nitrogen. But of course, you get to the point where, you know, we're putting another buck 20 nitrogen on, we're incrementally increasing our nitrogen application rates. But if you're only getting a dollar's worth of corn back out of that uh, application, well, at that point, obviously, it doesn't make sense to continue putting more nitrogen on. Um, we would have wanted to stop applying nitrogen. And that's kind of where this uh, this dot. So again, we call it MERN or the most economic rate of nitrogen uh, for that curve. So of course, the question is, how does that change when you change price ratios? Kind of like what we did with the corn calculator. So I did the exact same calculations here. You can see the corn revenue line, the end cost and the net returns, uh, but this time using our 10 year average. So $5 a bushel of corn and 60 cents per pound of nitrogen. And uh, in this case here, you can see that MERN has shifted up just a little bit compared to what it was for our 2022 scenario. So instead of 116 being our optimum, now our optimum is 126. Because nitrogen is a little bit cheaper, it makes sense to go a little bit farther up that curve. Uh, <clears throat> and again, when we're, when we're changing prices, what we're really doing is just moving that MERN point on our, our nitrogen response curve. So again, a price ratio of 10 for our 2022 scenario is going to be a little bit lower on that curve 
than what a price ratio would be for our, our 10 year average scenario. So again, just to kind of show or, you know, kind of prove that this kind of makes sense. This is a, uh, an end response uh, data set again, from the same set of trials that Greg Stewart had done back in, uh, in 2011 to 2015. I just did the exact same exercise I did there for all 15 curves in this database. And when you look at the difference in recommendation between the red dot and the green dot, which would represent the 2022 and 2000 and, or the, and the 10 year average, on average, the distance between those is about 12 pounds an acre. So would suggest if you're just changing economics um, to pull back about 12 pounds an acre in this data set. And again, it varied depending on location. The, the least reduction we did was three pounds and the greatest reduction we did was 22. So again, it's uh, maybe a little bit less than what the end calculator has suggested, uh, but we're certainly we're in the realm in terms of being, you know, maybe a 10 percent uh, ish uh, kind of reduction in nitrogen rates. So again, if it kind of comes back to the question, you know, we've increased nitrogen rates, so or we've increased price of nitrogen so much, why are we only coming down maybe 10% in terms of a uh, nitrogen rate? I think in this scenario, there's uh, one thing that has come into play is that, uh, well, nitrogen prices have gone up, corn prices have also gone up with them. So um, while nitrogen has gone up more, um, it's maybe with corn prices increasing, it's maybe muted how much of a change it would have been had corn prices not also come up. Um, you know, if we hadn't changed corn prices, then we would have had a price ratio of 13, which still maybe would have moved us down that curve a little bit more than what we are today with, uh, say, a 10 for a price ratio. But I think one of the bigger factors of why we don't change more is that, uh, you know, as you're changing economics and moving down that curve, you really don't have to move that far down that curve before the yield losses you're incurring. Uh, really start to outweigh the savings you're getting in terms of uh, nitrogen costs. So, you know, those price ratios, because we've got that quadratic uh, shape, you know, your price ratios are going to have to start increasing almost exponentially to really move you down the curve. So, again, I think the biggest reason why we don't move a lot is that yield losses really start to increase as you move down the curve. And that's why we just don't go down that curve a lot in terms of changes in optimum end rates uh, when you change the economics. So that's a, just a really quick rundown. There's other factors that influence things as well. So uh, again, year to year variability can have big impacts in terms of what our nitrogen curves look like and where MERN will end up being. At some research done at the Allura Research Station, they've suggested that year to year variability uh, in terms of curves could actually be more than what the, the price differences are. So, you know, I think in general, if you have a rate that you think is pretty good on your farm and is good for you most years, you know, a reduction in nitrogen rates based on prices is uh, is probably warranted. If you're afraid cutting things back might, uh, you're close to the edge or, you know, some years you might lose yield, you maybe have to consider that if you're trying to make an adjustment. And I think on the other side of things, you know, if, if you've got nitrogen credits you don't typically use, whether it's red clover or alfalfa or manure, uh, certainly year like 2022 would be a good year to try to make sure that you're including some of those credits uh, in your nitrogen program. That's kind of a quick rundown of nitrogen. I'll uh, I'll just go really quickly through uh, through phosphorus and potassium as well. So I'm not going to talk about rate adjustments as much for phosphorus, but I will kind of say, you know, how can you ensure you're getting a good ROI for your P fertilizer investments in 2022? And I was happy to hear Mike say it right at the beginning. You know, in terms of trying to uh, improve your probability of uh, getting an economic response to phosphorus. I think, you know, the best low hanging fruit to try to make some of those decisions is uh, is a good soil test, something that's up to date and is going to reflect your current situation in your field. And I'll show some data, I think, why that is. So uh, this was from some uh, a, a research summary that had been conducted again by uh, by Greg Stewart and Ken Janovic at the University of Guelph. And uh, they had pulled as much kind of more modern phosphorus research that had been done in Ontario just to look at responses by soil test, um, in particular to look at do current OMAFRA recommendations uh, still do a good job in terms of suggesting the right rate of application in that year of application. So this is a summary of all the trials that they had pulled since those original recommendations had been made. So none of this data was actually used to develop recommendations. And, uh, and it's split into kind of two data sets. So if you look at the black dots, those would be trials where they banded fertilizer on the planter. And then if you look at the brown diamonds, those would be trials where the rates of phosphorus uh, were put out as a broadcast phosphorus application. 
So all of these trials are multi-rate uh, phosphorus trials. So just like nitrogen, they could come up with curves and identify what the optimum rate of phosphorus was at each of those trials. So just as an example, uh, if you look at the black dot on the far left-hand side of the graph, at that research trial, the, the PPM in that test was about three, and the optimum rate of phosphorus in that trial was a little over 60 pounds of P2O5 per acre. I think there's a couple things you can notice. One is that, generally speaking, the banded trials tend to have lower optimum rates of phosphorus than what there are for the broadcast trials. Again, this isn't new news. You know, we talk about how phosphorus uptake is a lot more efficient when it's placed in a lot closer proximity to the seed for uptake because phosphorus isn't mobile in the soil. Um, so it makes sense that our phosphorus trials that where, where phosphorus is banded will generally have a lower optimum rate of P because it's more efficient. If you put a line of best fit through this uh, through this curve, it would look something like this. And I think the real important point you can see here is that, you know, once you get down somewhere between 10 and 15 ppm, in this case here, the line of best fit is at 13. You know, there's an inflection point where optimum rate of phosphorus really starts to increase. So we aren't showing yield responses here. Uh, the yield responses would look pretty similar to what you see in terms of the relationship for most economic rate of phosphorus. So where the most economic rate of phosphorus really starts to increase are the same soil tests where you'd really start to see a sharp increase in yields uh, for phosphorus applications as well. Uh, so yeah, I think you can see in here that obviously as you run a soil test lower and lower, your probability of seeing a response uh, really starts to increase in terms of, uh, of phosphorus and the optimum rate you need to maximize economics uh, increases as well the lower you go. You know, certainly if you, as you start to get below 20, we see some more points where it starts to get a little bit higher. But certainly as you get below, you know, 13, 12 ppm, uh, that's where those economic rates really start to increase a lot. Uh, so, yeah, I guess the one comment I haven't really covered in terms of a, a change in rate like I did with nitrogen. I think the story would be similar here. If you change the prices of phosphorus in the, the data set and try to see how that changes things. My guess is it maybe drops things a little bit, kind of like what it did with nitrogen, but I don't think it really changes the, the application rates a lot, kind of like it did in the nitrogen example. Um, I think the real important thing to think about is, uh, you know, what fields are really going to have a strong economic response to phosphorus. And again, I think, uh, I think this data set shows that, you know, if you're on low testing soils, there's a high probability. It was not fun having to pay a lot for, uh, for, for phosphorus fertilizer, but if there's still an economic incentive and, and good yield response to do so, then it still makes good economic sense to do that. If you're in a, a high soil test scenario where in the year of application, we wouldn't expect much response. And, you know, if you have a 40 or 50 PPM where we wouldn't expect much response uh, most of the time, then, you know, this is maybe the year where you avoid application if you think phosphorus prices uh, might come down in the future uh, and to wait things out. You know, if you if you miss applications for a year or two, it will drop your soil test likely a little bit. Um, but uh, in these cases here, I don't think it's giving up any yield, uh, certainly in the in the year of application. I guess the last comment for phosphorus I wanted to make is that, uh, you know, if you if you look at current OMAFR recommendations, so I've put them in here with this green line here, you know, with, even with this newer data that wasn't included in the recommendations, you know, the majority of the time those recommendations would still have uh, have reach that maximum economic rate of P for most of these trials, which would suggest, again, in that year of application, those recommendations still do a, a fairly good job of, of providing a rate that's going to provide a, a good economic response. So again, I, I copied uh, or covered uh, P rate adjustments a little bit. And again, I'll just I'll finish up really quickly here with K, you know, really similar story. We didn't have a good data set in Ontario where uh, where we had multi-rate K trials. So we had optimum rates of K for given soil tests, but there was a large number of trials where we had looked at uh, just phosphorus as a starter fertilizer package, and then bringing some potash into that blend on top and seeing what the yield response was for including potash in that uh, phosphorus starter. So that can still sh give us uh, an idea of, you know, where at what soil test do we really start seeing strong responses to potash? So again, this is the data set from 38 trials uh, in Ontario where, where that was looked at. Um, and just like the phosphorus examples, if we put a line of best fit in there, you can really see that, you know, once you get down to maybe the, the 120 range, we start to see that line increase. And certainly as you get sub 100, we're you know, getting consistently high yield responses 
for bringing potash into that blend. So getting strong responses at those soil tests. Again, if you try to do some quick economics, I just threw a price in here. Um, you know, I said in this case, they were adding on average 35 pounds an acre of, of K2O, which I said, you know, maybe based on prices might cost you $30 an acre to, uh, to do that. Um, if I use a 675 price I use in the 2022 price scenario, which suggests you need at least four bushels an acre to break even for adding that 35 pounds of nitrogen. And again, in this data set, once you got down to a 110 or a 100 uh, soil test for K, um, on average, we are seeing uh, you know a, a positive economic response for that application. And certainly, as you get lower and lower, our suggested application rate to be much more than 35. So you know the yield responses could be even more than that when you get down to lower soil tests. And again, this is just an example of the Omafra soil rec soil test K recommendations. I can't compare optimum rates because again, these weren't multi-rate trials, but if you look at the shape of the uh, soil test recommendation curve relative to the shape of responses we got for these trials where K was included uh, on top of a, a phosphorus starter fertilizer program, you can see that the responses or where our responses start somewhere a little over hundred uh, PPM uh, certainly mirrors what we saw in these trials. So again, I can't compare actual recommendation rates, but certainly the, the soil test levels where we start to suggest increase in K, I think uh, certainly uh, certainly agrees uh, with this uh, with this data set. But with that, I'll uh, I'll leave things there and uh, and answer any questions there might be. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Ben, for that overview. Uh, I think it's safe to say that you've spent a lot of time looking at, you know, the optimal end rate on, on your farm for this upcoming season. And we, we really appreciate the overview. Uh, so now we'll turn it over to the Q&A portion of today's session. And I wanted to introduce first uh, GFO staff on the call, uh, Laura Ferrier, agronomist, as well as Marty Vermey, senior agronomist and just open the, the floor to some discussion now and, and you know, ask some questions of, of Ben and, and some of the information that was presented. Um, I guess maybe I'll start first. And, you know, as you mentioned, optimal rate and, and managing that economic curve, um, you know, how does timing impact that? And, and, you know, given this year and we're into a bit of a, a wet and cooler start, could you maybe comment a little further on, on that timing component, Ben? Yeah, so on the nitrogen side of things, again, our traditional nitrogen calculator would suggest that particularly if you're on a heavier soil, uh, there is some side dress credit there. So if you were moving from an upfront application to a side dress, traditional side dress application, you could cut rates a little bit because we it, the database would suggest that on average, uh, it's a bit more efficient to come in with a side dress timing. Again, I think it depends what soil you're on. If, if you go in the calculator and you plug anything that has sand in the name, so sand soil, or a loamy sand, there actually is no side dress credit, which would suggest losses don't tend to be as much of an issue on sand soils. Uh, if you're in a medium testing soil, there's a bit of a credit, but it's not as big as what it is on a clay loam or a clay type soil. Um, so I, I would say that on the nitrogen front, if you think P and K, you know, you know, nutrients that aren't quite as mobile, uh, it's maybe not a timing thing as much as a placement thing. Um, you know, having some of that where it's close to the plant able to be taken up early on. I think that's important. Again, we, we know that story with phosphorus and it's preached a lot. Um, I think it holds true a bit for potash as well. There's been some work in the province that suggests there's a benefit for making sure there's maybe a bit of potash uh, in the starter if you can. But if you've got the ability to put starter placement down and, and you haven't done it in the past for logistics or whatever, but you're looking for a way to increase efficiency, you're getting the most out of your fertilizer dollar, especially in those low testing grounds, it's pretty hard to beat uh, that nice placement with a starter blend or, you know, maybe through a strip tiller kind of thing compared to broadcasting on low testing ground. Thanks, Ben. I got another question for you. I was kind of wondering regarding testing nitrogen rates. I know that now this year that a lot of farmers are maybe going to be playing with their rates a bit, maybe looking at calculators and making some adjustments down. They may want to double check what their you know previous rate was. And just wonder, what would you recommend if somebody was doing a nitrogen trial on their own farm? What would be like a low rate, their target rate, and their high rate? Should it be like 20 pounds difference, 25, 30? Where can you start to segregate and see the data, some different numbers and some values on either side? Yeah, so I think it depends on what your risk tolerance is and, and where you want to go with that sort of thing. You know, if 
if you were really keen and you really wanted a nice curve, you could put the five rates out like we did and replicate it twice. Um, it's maybe not very appealing to do when you've got to leave nitrogen strips when corn's at $8 with no nitrogen. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I would say probably the easiest way to do it. If you just want to get a general idea, you know, can I pull back without a lot of risk or are we going to start to see some yield losses if I pull back? You know, if you change your nitrogen rates, maybe 30, 40 pounds up and below what your typical grower rate is, uh, that would at least give you an idea of how close to the edge you are. And ideally, if, you know, if you could build a bit of a history or a bit of a data set of that on your own farms, I think it would really give you a good handle in terms of if you could comfortably pull back rate. You know, if you were sitting on 10 years of that data right now and you looked at it and said, man, in the last 10 years, I've never lost a yield pulling back 30 pounds. And a year like this year, you could probably fairly comfortably say, well, I'm going to pull back 30 pounds. There's probably not a lot of risk there. If you get the data set and you saw, you know, in some really high uh, response years, so maybe a, a wet year where you've lost nitrogen on a heavier soil or an exceptional yielding year like 2021, um, that would give you maybe a good gauge to go by saying, you know, in 2021, we saw <coughs> exceptional yields. Optimum end rates are probably pretty high to maximize those yields. If we didn't lose any yield in that year, then I would say, well, even in a high yielding year, our grower rate was good. Uh, whereas if you saw in some of those good test years, we did start to lose rates, then you could say maybe that's kind of the edge where I need to be. And that's where risk is if it's a year that we need more nitrogen because of yield or end losses. So, yeah, I would say, Marty, you know, putting out 30 or 40 pounds up or below your, your normal rate uh, and start to build a bit of a history. I think uh, some of that could really give some good guidance going forwards. Ben, I've got a quick question for you. Uh, talking nitrogen stabilizers uh, and fixing bacteria, biostimulants, like what are your thoughts on on any or all of those approaching this season? Yeah, so that's a good question. I didn't get into them too much in the presentation. Certainly some of the work, especially on heavier soils, has shown a strong benefit for some of the N inhibitors. So Craig Jury, who's done a lot of work down in Essex County on, on heavier soils, um, I think, you know, generally we know if you're putting nitrogen on the surface and you're in an environment where there's going to be potential for losses um, that, you know, in a lot of cases, I think a urease inhibitor would be recommended. Um, there's still questions in terms of, you know, nitrification inhibitors. So uh, putting fertilizer down, but trying to slow the conversion into nitrate where it's going to be susceptible to loss. Um, but again, a lot of the work done on the heavy soils that Craig Jury has done, he's quite positive on them. It'd be nice to see some more work done on other soils in Ontario too, to, to get a bit of a bigger data set, but certainly on the heavier soils, at least Craig Jury's work has been quite positive on them. Um, on the, the biologicals and end fixation. Yeah. I think that's a kind of a question going forwards. Um, if we can find some biological products that are going to reliably work and, you know, replace fertilizer nitrogen, that'd be a huge win, I think for agriculture. But uh, I know there's been some on-farm trials going on this past year. I think there's some plans to continue on with some products that are out there. Um, but I think there's uh, some time needed to build some of those data sets and get a good handle on some of those products. I've got one other question. Uh, looking, and mine aren't, mine aren't necessarily to deal with your, your presentation that you've, you've given, which was spectacular, but also looking forward into, into this, further into the spring and into the summer. PSNT testing. And uh, looking at that, what do growers need to know about that? Uh, how do they go about getting that done as we approach that timing and, uh, and just general general um, info that they might be interested in? Yep. So one other tool that you could use if you're trying to zero in on a nitrogen rate for your farm is, uh, so the end calculator kind of goes by, you know, a historical database of nitrogen response curve from research that's been done in Ontario. Um, so it kind of gives you an average of you put in your conditions and, and what's kind of an average response we could get. So when, when I think when those recommendations had first come out, one weakness of them was that you weren't necessarily capturing fields that had a really high supplying potential or really low nitrogen su supplying potential. So um, back in the, uh, in the 1980s, there was a project that was done to try to calibrate a soil nitrogen test to, uh, to better identify fields that just might provide a lot of nitrogen so you can cut rates back or fields that are really low and you could maybe have to increase rates compared to general recommendations. So uh, if you are in a scenario, you'd like to get a better handle on that or see what, how your supply is relative to, uh, you know, maybe to other fields, then uh, you would want to go in before, uh, before side dress timing and, uh, and do a 12 inch soil core. So unlike a normal P and K sample, 
we want to pull a full 12 inch core out of the soil. Uh, you want to keep that core cool so you can't just store it like you can a PK sample because the microbes will change those nitrogen levels over time. So we want to keep things cool and get them to a lab as soon as possible. And uh, the lab will give you a PPM value for that test. And then there's there's recommendations um, in the agronomy guide where you can go to and see if you have a, a soil test PPM of 20, um, what would be the, the nitrogen rate for that given soil test? So yeah, if you haven't used it before, maybe one more piece of information to use. Um, there's a couple cautions. One is that you don't want to use it where you've already applied any broadcast nitrogen fertilizer because it's really trying to go off the natural release in that soil. If you're picking up broadcast fertilizer, then it's going to think you've got more natural release than what you actually do. And it's going to give you a recommendation that's going to be lower than what it actually should be. Um, but yeah, that that kind of be the quick and dirty on doing PSNT samples. And uh, again, the recommendations themselves and some more instructions are available in the agronomy guide as well. That's great. Thank you. Just something that I thought uh, people might be might be thinking of if they as, as uh, the season goes, if fertilizer is still high priced and maybe unavailable or is available, uh, what they what they may be looking for going forward. Thanks. I don't know if there's any more questions from uh, from the panel here, but if if there isn't any, I think we'll we'll wrap things up. So just wanted to say thank you very much to our guest speakers for today. Uh, thank you, Ben, for the overview and appreciate all the work that you've done to this point. Uh, we do have CEU credits available, so we will be posting these at the end of today's webinar. So stay tuned for that. Um, we will continue with our Grain Talk webinar series for this upcoming growing season. And additionally, for those who have yet to seen it, Grain Farmers of Ontario has also put together a webinar on the spring uh, season and herbicide supply channel and proper weed control. So visit our website, gfo.ca, to view this recording. And once again, thank you to everyone for viewing today.